Okay, good morning everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are now being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, hover your mouse over my name, Dan Wilton, and a menu will appear to send me a private chat message. Below the participants list is the chat area. The chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post your responses to anything that might come up during the presentation. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions or ask, uh, um, make points to our presenter at the end of the talk. The main window is the projection screen for the slides, and above that you'll find a button showing a person with a raised hand. That's a pull-down menu for making the session more interactive, with options for a smiley or applause. After the presentation, we'll release the microphone for questions. To use your microphone, click the microphone button next to the little man once to begin speaking and again to disconnect when you've done your question. Do remember to keep your microphone off when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback or background noises. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the CIDR 2016-17 series from the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. As our regular audience members will know, we have over the years tended to give disproportionate attention to post-secondary education, a bias we're now trying to rectify with a number of initiatives, including a new program for K-12 teachers through the Center of Distance Education, and of course, our ongoing mini-series of State of the Nation reports on Canadian K-12 online learning here at CIDR. Our speaker today is the author of those State of the Nation reports, Dr. Michael Barbour, Associate Professor of Instructional Design at the College of Education and Health Services at Truro University, Mare Island, south of the border in California. Our second list listed guest, Dr. Tom Clark, President at Clark Consulting in Springfield, Illinois, will unfortunately not be able to join us today. Doctors Clark and Barbour are co-editors of Online, Blended and Distance Education in Schools, of which you'll hear much more today. Dr. Barbour holds a PhD in Instructional Technology and a Certificate in Adult Education from St. Francis Xavier. His background, however, is rooted in the secondary level, and one of his research focuses has been on rural K-12 students learning in virtual school environments. He has been a teacher at Discovery Collegiate and director of the Center for Advanced Placement Education. He was recently director of doctoral studies at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut before joining Truro. Dr. Clark is a researcher, author, and consultant in digital learning with a background in educational administration and program evaluation. He has evaluated a number of projects across the United States, including virtual school programs and museum projects. In addition to the book you'll be hearing about today, he has recently published a set of case studies of K-12 online learning programs in Michigan, and his goal is to improve digital learning through research and evaluation. A reminder to everyone, we currently have an open call out for researchers who would like to present to our CIDR audience, and I'm also happy to announce our next session with Mohamed Akhtarazman at Monash University in Australia, speaking on a socio-technological approach to address DE issues in developing and developed countries on December 7th at a special time of 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Keep an eye on our site at ciderathabascau.ca for updates. You'll also find these slides and a recording of this session will be available in about two hours. I am now passing the microphone to Dr. Barbour. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Dr. Michael Barbour. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think I'm coming through here now, and if someone can actually verify that in the chat box, that would be perfect. Thank you. Um, as Dan mentioned, um, this is actually, I guess, probably the fifth or sixth time I've presented at a CIDR session, although 
Um, most of those have actually focused upon the State of the Nation project, which is a look at uh, K-12 distance online and blended learning across Canada. Um, and we actually have one of those scheduled for early in 2017. We haven't selected the exact month yet, uh, but the 2016 report will be coming out probably sometime in mid-December. Uh, so we'll be having a session on that, and I've actually put the project link down in the chat box for you there. As well, Dan mentioned the BOLT program that Athabasca is doing, which is uh, nice to see. Uh, some of the teacher ed programs in Canada starting to move down this way. And uh, so blended online um, learning and teaching is what their program focuses upon, and I've put a link for that in the chat box as well. So... Um, but today I want to talk to you a little bit about a book that Tom Clark and I edited about, I guess it was almost a year and a half ago now it came out, because it came out very early in 2015. And um, there's a, a couple of things I want to mention about it. Uh, first, it is actually part of a series that uh, Stylus has been doing, focusing up on online blended and distance education that's been uh, edited um, in a broader sense by Michael Moore, who is uh, sort of one of the, the founders of the, the modern distance education movement, at least in terms of the uh, research that we've gotten and a lot of the theory within the field as well. So you'll find within this particular series, there are uh, books that focus more upon the post-secondary environment. There's a couple, uh, one that focuses more upon the, the corporate uh, sector. Uh, there are ones that focus specifically more on the blended hybrid. Um, and Tom's and uh, my book uh, focus more upon the K-12 environment. So just to give you, I guess, a, a little bit of, of background, uh, when Michael came to us and asked us about producing a K-12 focused book as a part of this series. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do when we looked at what was available in the field, there had been a couple of books related to K-12 online learning at the time. Um, Curie Rice had actually just released a book uh, called Making the Move to K-12 Online Teaching, where she was looking at some of the research that we knew within the, the K-12 online learning environment, more generally within the online teaching environment in general and looking at how that applied to the K-12 environment. So we were trying to sort of figure out what could we do that was a little bit different. Uh, Tom, a couple of years earlier, had written and or had edited a book with Zane Berg on virtual schooling, Planning for Success, where they had some initial chapters up front that looked at issues surrounding uh, virtual schooling or K-12 online learning. And then the second half of the book were a series of case studies that sort of put meat around the bones of those issues, if you will, and provided um, some real-world examples of how individual programs were dealing with many of those uh, issues that uh, were raised in the first half of the book. And we, we thought that was probably a good model to follow, but we wanted to do something that was different. We didn't simply want to do what would amount to a second edition of the, the book that Zane and, and Tom edited. Uh, and the thing that we sort of settled upon that we felt that would make this book a little bit unique uh, were the international contacts that both Tom and I had. Um, this idea of looking at um, what do we know from particularly the U.S. context and the international context and how can we learn from each of those. You know, so what can the folks in the U.S. learn from some of the successful international programs that we can find and what can folks outside of the U.S. learn from the American context. So when we actually started looking at uh, putting this together, um, we did follow that kind of model where, you know, we looked at those expert chapters up front. So we went out and sought folks in the field that were known for particular issues. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind almost immediately is this idea of equity and access within the online learning environment, particularly the K-12 environment, which is something that uh, if you're familiar with the field, the one name that would show up every time that you would uh, think of the issue of equity would be Ray Rose. Um, folks like Catherine Kennedy and Leanne Arshambo looking at teacher preparation. Um, Kevin Oliver and, and the, the folks that are working in North Carolina when you look at teacher professional development. So we went out and sort of went after a lot of these, uh, I guess, known scholars to work on 
what were some of the issues that we were facing and what did we know from these issues. And then similar to the earlier book that Tom and Zane did, we wanted to find these specific case studies. And we ended up with four from the U.S. and then five that were international ones. And um, we did a pretty good job, I think, of selecting sort of our international jurisdictions. Um, you know, we've got Canada represented there. We've got Nepal, Australia. Um, we've got the UK, and we also have South Korea there, which were, if you're familiar with the literature into online learning in the international environment, um, while there's a lot written about Canada and, and myself and actually a lot of the scholars at Memorial University of Newfoundland are responsible for much of that, um, we also know a fair amount about New Zealand when it comes to online learning, to a lesser extent Australia, but many of those other countries, even the UK, uh, were countries that when it came to distance online and blended learning at the, the K-12 level or within the primary secondary environment were really areas that we didn't know a lot about. Um, so we were really sort of fortunate to be able to bring those people in. Looking specifically at the case studies, so those uh, four from the United States and those five international case studies, um, these were the questions that we essentially asked each of those particular authors to address as they were um, looking at uh, how, you know, what we could learn from their particular programs. Um, now, before I sort of get into the themes within the book and some of the, the, I guess, lessons that we've learned, one of the things that I did want to point out, um, we do actually have a wiki for the, uh, the book. Um, the bit um, URL for it is bitdo. Uh, or for, sorry forward slash obde or online blended distance education wiki, or if your memory is a little bit better, just online blended schooling. is where the actual wiki is, and I'd encourage you to go and, and look at that. It's a really nice companion site for the book. So when you actually go there, you'll note that uh, we have a lot of resources that we've put up there, just generally speaking for the book. Um, you'll see uh, one of the first links that we have there is this using this wiki in class ideas for professors. Um, one of the things that I would actually encourage with this wiki is that while it says for professors and we sort of created it in with the idea that um, this, it wanted to be a resource for folks that might be using it within their own classes. Uh, if you have a staff who are doing, say, a professional development book study using this book, uh, this wiki would be just as useful to you. Uh, you'll notice we have some educator resources there. We've got a poster that outlines sort of the eight trends that I'll be talking about today. Um, we include links to all of the book reviews that have been done for this particular uh, project as well as links to all of the presentations. So at some point later this afternoon, the slides that you see here as well as the recording that Dan will post will also be available on the wiki. Uh, finally, when you go into each of the chapters, uh, there are several chapters there where you can actually download the text of the chapter. So I'm looking at the page for the first chapter here. Um, we provide sort of an abstract uh, for each of the chapters. We provide discussion questions that you could use in class or that if you're doing a book study around this, that might be useful to you. Uh, if you were to scroll down there, and I didn't get a screenshot of the bottom part of it, there are actually additional resources that we've linked in there, as well as we've provided a complete reference list or complete bibliography for each chapter there. So uh, even if you don't have a copy of the book, you can still access a lot of the resources that we have available to you. Um, just from this particular wiki site. So if you haven't checked it out already, um, it is something that I would highly or strongly encourage. So talking about the uh, key trends that we found, one of the things that Tom and I did as we were sort of producing this is as a way of concluding the book, instead of sort of summarizing the things that we um, saw within the, the, the various chapters and sort of trying to, um, you know, bring together some larger closure. One of the things that we, or I guess the thing that we decided to do was to actually, in a, kind of an unsystematic way, to be perfectly honest with you, look at what we thought were some of the themes or trends that we had seen 
across the 15 chapters that preceded that final chapter. Uh, so obviously excluding the first chapter. And one of the things that we, we gleaned from that was this idea of these, these eight key trends. And when I talk about the book and when Tom talks about the book, uh, we try to frame our discussions around these eight trends because uh, as we look through the examples and as we look through sort of the issues that some of our, our scholars have examined, um, they can all sort of tie back to one or more of these eight trends. So I want to spend some time talking about each of these and then uh, depending upon where we are for time, uh, I may provide a bit of a Canadian example here or I may simply just open it up to questions. And if you have questions along the way, feel free to, uh, or comments, put them in the chat box as Dan indicated. Um, if it's thematically appropriate, I'll try to sort of address or answer them as we're going through. Otherwise, um, I'll, we'll wait till the end, but that way at least your question is sort of recorded and we can go and take a look at it then. So looking at the first of these trends, this idea that um, online distance and blended learning really is a global phenomenon. If you look at um, the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, um, over the past decade they've actually done a couple of international surveys. Uh, one was in 2011 and then they did a, a follow-up one to that um, uh, that I was involved with. Uh, so the initial one was done by Allison Powell and Susan Patrick uh, where they looked at about 20 or 30 different countries. Uh, the larger one that I was involved with, we actually had responses from, I believe it was actually 51 uh, countries around the world looking at um, what they were doing when it came to K-12 distance online and blended learning. And it was interesting that, um, as you can see from the map here, with the exception of uh, South America, really we saw some kind of activity and some kind of interest in this throughout the entire world. And... Um, I suspect that you know the responses when you can, you can see there's nothing in South Africa and for that or South America, sorry, and there's nothing in a lot of the African countries. And I think that speaks more to our ability to get information about what's going on there than it does about the lack of activity that we actually see there. Um, you know, to use a couple of examples of things that aren't currently on the map there, uh, you'll notice a country like Iceland. Uh, isn't colored in on that map, but I know that there is uh, a distance education program there that actually I've just been interacting with um, some of the researchers looking into it and some of the folks that are actually behind it just in this past month. Um, and it's a program that's actually been in existence now for over a decade. Uh, similarly, Ireland isn't colored in there, but um, Ireland have a program called iSchool, uh, which is a, an online program that they've been developing there for the last five or six years. So, you know, there's a lot of activity that's happening. There's a lot of activity that's happening sort of under the radar, at least under the radar in terms of the English language literature that we have available or to us North American scholars. Um, if you're sort of interested in what's happening in a global perspective, beyond the six, the five chapters or six chapters, if you count the Canadian one, that we have here in the book that look at uh, different parts of the world, um, one of the things I'd highly recommend is there's a, an initiative that was uh, funded in Europe called VISCED, uh, V-I-S-C-E-D, which was actually uh, virtual schools and college, or the provision of virtual schools and colleges. Um, I don't know how VISIT became that, but um, if you just Google VISIT or and put virtual school in there, uh, you'll find that this is a wonderful initiative. Um, in fact, it um, has a, a great wiki as a part of the project, and within that wiki, they actually list off all of the uh, online and distance programs that they were able to identify around the world. And it is probably the most extensive and the most complete list of international distance online and blended learning that is available. Uh, I just pulled up the link there in Google so and um, posted it in the chat box. So if you're interested in what's happening internationally, that's actually a very good uh, resource to look at. Paul Bashish was the uh, lead researcher as a part of that. Um, but K-12 distance online and blended learning is really a global phenomenon. Uh, the second trend that we noticed is that 
Um, it's also becoming a, a more open phenomenon. And we looked at open in terms of two ways. The first was this idea of, you know, OERs or open education resources and even the use of um, open LMS systems like Moodle and Sakai and some of the others and the growth that Canvas and, and um, you know, the growth that we've seen in some of these programs, uh, particularly within the K-12 sector. Um, you know, while these programs sort of have some activity throughout, it's really within the K-12 sector that we're seeing a greater movement to uh, these open resources that we find. And I think economics is probably one of the bigger reasons of that. But the other thing that we thought of when we were actually looking at this idea of an open learning environment was the actual physical environment that we see. You know, so if you look at Mickey Revenau's chapter, uh, in the book where she talks about the Nexus Academies that have been developed in the United States. One of the things that is a hallmark of, of those programs, and for that matter, a lot of the blended learning schools that we see in the United States, is this idea of an open learning space. Um, you see colleges and universities across North America and Europe are moving towards this model, this idea that you know making libraries more like Starbucks. And um, it's interesting to see within the distance online and blended community that we're starting to see this happening within the K-12 environment as well. While not referenced specifically in the book, um, one of the projects that I was involved in a number of years ago uh, in New Zealand was uh, brought me to a school called Roxborough Area School, which is down in the southern part of the South Island of New Zealand. And it was interesting that they were actually just in the process then of starting a complete redesign of the high school portion of their all-grade school. And it really was along this idea of an open learning environment where, um, you know, you walked into a main room that, you know, had tables and some study carousels and some, you know, desks and that kind of thing. But when you looked off to the side, you had these... Um, you know, these open, or these, you know, large windows that opened into these study rooms uh, that you could have these large or small group meetings in, but you could still have a teacher that was able to sort of look into the room and see what was going on. So students could be working in there independently, or if as a teacher, you had a small group of students that needed additional instruction beyond what was provided in sort of the online environment or the blended environment that you could pull them into this room and have a, a more intense session. And that's kind of the model that we see with a lot of these blended programs in the U.S. as well, which, uh, you know, is, is sort of a fascinating way when you look at how do we redesign school for, uh, you know, the current millennium that we're in. One of the other things that we saw throughout the chapters was this idea of, um, mobile learning and, and the ability to really learn anywhere uh, at any time. And um, it's interesting that it's actually in a lot of the um, non-Western countries where we see this happening the most. Um, so Kathy Kavanaugh, for example, in her chapter looking at Nepal and type some of the things that they are doing there, um, she looks at this idea of mobile learning um, namely because in a lot of cases, you know, it's difficult to sort of lay fiber and have that hardwired connectivity for schools all across the country. So when you're looking at, you know, a lot of the, the African nations, many of the Asian nations, uh, South America for that matter, a lot of these countries are moving more towards online learning and, or blended learning in a mobile setting as opposed to the traditional sort of distance setting that, we've seen happening primarily here in North America. Um, and it's a fascinating thing to see because in that respect, you know, they're kind of leapfrogging us in terms of what we see occurring in these kinds of environments. Um, you know, so if you look at, uh, and Kathy's chapter, I have to say, is probably the best example of this in, in the entire book when you're looking at this, although you do see pieces of it in other chapters. I know, for example, the, the Canadian chapter that uh, Steve Baker and his team at the virtual high school in Ontario uh, do, they look at, you know, the use of mobile devices as a part of their delivery model as well. Um, but Kathy's chapter is really sort of the one that uh, I think hits home with this and, and probably provides the best illustration. Interestingly, one of the things that we see happening more and more 
um, particularly within the North American environment, less so uh, when we start looking internationally. And, and when I say North American, I guess I should say within the U.S. environment is probably the better example, um, is this idea of blended learning. And I've often said when I speak, um, regardless if it's in the U.S. or internationally, that um, blended learning is, is a term that, ha at least within the U.S., has really gotten taken up within sort of the online and blended community. Uh, whereas when you look outside of the United States, um, the first thing that you note is we're less concerned with these kinds of models that you see folks like uh, Stocker and Horn presenting, um, setting up full schools like the Nexus Academies that Mickey talks about in her chapter, like some of the drop-in centers that um, Alison Powell and her co-author talk about in her chapter, but we see more of this idea of a continuum of learning that ranges from, you know, the traditional classroom-based learning to the completely online digital learning, and blended learning just falls somewhere in between those two ends of the spectrum. And when we start looking at, you know, the Australian chapter that Stephen Harris writes is a great example of this, um, as is the, the South Korean chapter. Um, you know, technology and, and the idea of blended learning isn't seen as something being separate from what is happening in the traditional school environment. For those folks, when they talk about um, the use of digital technology uh, within their teaching environment, it's just a natural extension of good technology integration. And this is sort of the next iteration of it, if you will, based upon the particular tools that we have available to us. Um, the next trend that I want to mention that we sort of seen throughout the book uh, was this idea of, um, you know, having facilitated uh, learning. Um, and it's more than this idea or this cliche that I've often heard of, you know, that the teacher should be the guide on the side and not the sage on the stage. And in all honesty, as, as a researcher and, and a, a former K-12 teacher, that cliche, and I'll, I use that term very specifically, has always bothered me. Um, and the reason it's always bothered me is because it implies that the sage on the stage is a poor model for learning. And when we actually look at what we know about how students learn effectively, um, direct instruction actually is a, an effective method for many students in terms of their learning. So this idea that, you know, everything needs to be, um, you know, facilitated in some fashion and that lecturing is bad is really a, a myth that has permeated um, in all honesty, uh, for those of us in colleges of education, faculties of education, are guilty of, of doing this, and, and it's, it's something that is permeated out into the K-12 environment. When we talk about facilitated, we really talk about the idea that the role of the instructor in the online and blended environment has become diffused. So traditionally within a, a classroom, you know, a teacher is the one who, on a day-to-day -day basis, designs what it is that they want their students to be doing. They select the resources that are appropriate for their students uh, for whatever it is that they want to do today. They come into the classroom and they deliver whatever that particular lesson was in whatever particular fashion that they had, you know, set up. And then as the students are sort of working through whatever it is that you have the students doing, you know, that teacher walks around the room or, or you know, within, uh, you know, smaller or large groups, facilitates that additional understanding. In the online environment, and for that matter, even in the blended environment, in many cases, that role is done, or those roles, I should say, are done by separate individuals. Uh, so what we often see in the distance online and blended uh, community or setting is the instruction has already been designed by somebody else. Um, you know, so what it is that you're doing, particularly in the distant and online environment, has already been created for you. You walk in or you sit down, I guess, you log into your LMS and, you know, the content is magically there. 
It's, you know, been something that was designed by some teacher that was contracted by the online or distance program, or it's some commercial uh, proprietary thing that your school has bought into and is leased for a period of time. But in terms of actually designing the instruction, there's not a lot for you to do. Unless you're teaching in a more synchronous environment or you're in a more direct instruction blended environment, in all honesty, it's the computer and the online instruction that's actually delivering the content to the student. So in those kinds of environments, the role of the teacher is really to facilitate that learning. And in many cases, that means that the teacher is no longer necessarily a subject matter expert in that particular room. You know, so if you've got a group of students that are in your um, you know, class that are, are, are learning math in an online environment. Oftentimes, it's the online program that's providing that kind of instruction to them. And um, while they may have specific questions that as a qualified and certified math teacher that you could answer, in all honesty, the things that they're most in need of are those sort of soft learning skills. Uh, you know, the ability to be an independent learner, someone who's self or intrinsically motivated, someone who has good time management skills, someone who is self-directed. And it's a lot of those sort of facilitation kinds of skills that we see are really needed and are really exercised by teachers in these online and blended programs. Um, and that's, in all honesty, more so in the U.S. and, and to a lesser extent in Canada than we see outside of North America. Although it is something that, you know, if you look through, for example, the chapter from um, our South Korean colleagues, the Australian chapter, and the UK chapter, it's something that you see sort of looking, you know, permeating through all of those. And when you look at those expert chapters up front, um, you know, one of the things that Catherine Kennedy and Leanne Archambault will talk about um, in their chapter when they look at effective practices for online teaching, is this idea of how you know teaching has become diffused and it's really that support role that most teachers will end up um, performing. Uh, similarly speaking when you look at the chapter from the Boise State folks uh, in their online endorsement program, while there are aspects of their endorsement that focus upon sort of the online teacher and the online designer roles, it really is that online facilitator role that um, really their program sort of prides itself with. One of the other things that we see and that was common throughout many of the chapters, particularly when we looked at the case studies, was this idea of personalization. Um, and we've seen this in a lot of Canadian programs. You know, I, I'm looking through the names that I see here, and at least for the folks that have written their first and last names, many of them I'm familiar with the programs that they're involved with. And um, in some of these cases, we've got programs, for example, that um, have a continuous enrollment process so that, um, you know, the students, you could have a student starting a course today. You could have another student that started three weeks ago. You can have a start, student that's starting a month from today, and they're all starting the same course, uh, but they're you know added at different times. And in many of these programs, there isn't a specific end date. You know, so as long as the student is making progress, they can continue to work through. So you have students that are completing a course instead of in a ten-month school year that are taking a year and a half to do it. You have other students that instead of completing a course in a 10-month school year are doing the entire course in three months. And one of the, I think, great uh, affordances of many of these distance online and blended programs is that it allows students to do that. You know, students aren't tied to this lockstep method where, you know, school will start the first Tuesday after Labor Day and continue on for approximately 200 days and, you know, they're going to be tied to a specific timetable where we're going to do 60 minutes of math every uh, 10 periods every 14 days. Um, you know, one of the things that these online programs really allow for is that it really allows for the kind of flexibility for folks to personalize their instruction um, and also personalize the, the tools in which, 
they're using to be able to, you know, do these types of things. Um, you know, so it, it's a really interesting model that we're starting to see. And, you know, the chapters that you can see there, you know, Mickey Revenal was the Nexus Academy in the United States. Uh, the Smallwood, Rayburn, ba uh, and Baker one is the Virtual High School in Ontario. Uh, the Stephen Harris one is the Australia one. And the Helen Bolton and Lisa Hassler Waters is the one from the UK. Um, you know, so you can see that it's also not something that's just a North American thing. We're seeing this happening internationally, and for that matter, I could have put South Korea as another example that we see there, um, although I've used them, I think, three times already now, so which is why I didn't put them on this slide. Um, the other thing that we see within these online programs is that they tend to be adaptive. Now, I'll be honest and say that this is something that we see more within the U.S.-based programs than what we see within the international programs, um, particularly in the full-time online programs and in the blended learning programs. And the reason for this is because so many of the full-time online programs and the blended programs use a type of online course content that um, basically, it's set up in such a way that it is standards-based, tied to, in the case of the U.S., the Common Core Curriculum, which is what the CC stands for there on the second bullet point. And essentially what happens is a student would come in, they would take a test to under, so the system can figure out what they already know. And then the system adapts the instruction that they are exposed to based upon the stuff that they don't know. The idea being that why waste a student's time going over things that they already know when we can spend more time focused upon the things that they don't know. So one of the, the I have to say, one of the great affordances of some of these programs that we see in the U.S. in these full-time online schools and these blended schools is the ability for the curriculum to adapt to what the student does or does not know. The last sort of theme that we had within uh, the, the book was this idea of uh, evidence-based practice. One of the, I guess, sort of, I think, well, I'll be biased and say, as a researcher, one of the things that I see the greatest potential in K-12 distance online and blended learning is the fact that the nature of these systems just, well, it collects data. You know, you've got students that are logging into a system. You've got that system interacting with a student information system. You know, so the amount of information that you can have about students is just phenomenal. And from a research perspective, from a scholarship perspective, we've actually gotten past this idea of asking the question of, you know, does online learning work? Does blended learning work? How does it fare compared to face-to-face -face instruction? And I, I say we got past that. In all honesty, you will still see published on a regular basis um, research studies that actually do that sort of student performance comparison. And, you know, while I think that is probably a necessary line of inquiry, for those of us in the field, I don't think it's as useful a line of inquiry as, well, as my colleague Rick Fertig writes, you know, asking the question of under what conditions does online and learning work best, or does online and blended learning work best? Uh, I tend to sort of reframe that and say, how can we design, deliver, and support K-12 online or K-12 blended learning so that all learners can have success? And when we start to ask that question, and when you look at particularly the case study chapters that we've got here, that idea of, you know, trying to use evidence and trying to use research and trying to use best practices, um, to drive the things that we do within the K-12 online and blended environment um, are ones that I think, uh, well, I think we've got some good illustrations of this. And, you know, when you look at, you know, the, what's happening in these environments, in regardless if it's the online context or the blended context, 
you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, in a face-to-face -face classroom, you've got a teacher, you've got a student, you've got the student's peers, and you've got whatever resources that you've got available to you at that particular time. To a lesser extent, you might have, you know, the home environment and parents and all the things that that ensues, but because you've got them for a dedicated period of time, um, you know, that matters at least for looking at the evidence that you can collect a little bit less. When you're looking at, say, a full-time online environment where the student is learning from the home and the nature of support and the nature of technology and the nature of connectivity and, for that matter, how the curriculum is set up, um, you know, all of those things play a much larger role than what they would in a face-to-face -face class, at least when it comes to the evidence that they can provide to us, the data that they can provide to us. You know, because with the way these learning management systems collect information about a student, within a very short period of time, we should be able to generate enough data where we can say that, you know, if a student with these particular characteristics is, is a person in this particular period of time, we know that they will have success in this course. So because of that, we need to make sure that they are well supported at this given time. You know, and using things like uh, structural equational modeling, hierarchical linear modeling, we're able to say these in a general way. Uh, but we really aren't able to do it on a student-by-student -student basis at this point, at least not in any sort of leverageable way. Uh, there is some interesting work that Kathy Kavanaugh was actually doing with the, um, as a part of her work with Microsoft Education uh, using a particular tool called Assure Learning where she was actually able to go in and uh, using student behaviors within the learning management system and information about those students from the student information system. Uh, she was actually able to go in and map how students were going to do and then tie those things to specific reading remediations that were recommended by uh, the National Dropout Center in the United States. And her initial work in this, we're actually able to pinpoint you know, at a student level to say, okay, this student needs these two interventions at this particular time. Now, it's kind of unfortunate that Kathy is actually, um, actually only in the past week or so, uh, left Microsoft and is now going to work uh, down in Australia looking at their uh, primary and secondary system down there and, and how online learning can be more effective and, um, you know, Microsoft's loss is Australia's gain in that respect, although, you know, it really was a promising opportunity that we had with that particular line of inquiry that she was uh, starting to develop. And, um, but that's the ability that we have with these systems. You know, these systems collect massive amounts of data. And I know I'm spending a lot of time on this last of the eight themes, but it's because it's the one that I think has the most potential. You know, I think we're all in the business of education because we want our students to succeed, regardless of how we define success for that particular student. And the more information that we have about that student and the more that we can use that information to ensure that that student has success, I think really allows us, you know, the ability to make a meaningful difference in students, particularly students in all honesty, that haven't experienced a lot of success. Because if you look at, you know, the enrollment that we see in a lot of these programs, uh, particularly if you believe, you know, the organizations that offer these programs themselves or the proponents that argue that we need more of them, the students that we have in many of these programs haven't experienced a lot of success within our formal education environment. So, you know, if we have these tools available to us, really, I think the onus is upon us. And, you know, as we were talking about some of the differences in what the teacher does, and that would also roll over into the way in which we prepare teachers. Um, this idea of data analytics and the ability to, um, for a teacher, regardless if they're a classroom teacher that is using an LMS or if they're an online teacher or if they're facilitating students that are learning at a distance, the ability to use the analytics that are generated by the systems that are in place are skills that teachers lack right now. 
There are skills that teacher education programs and by and large professional development programs don't provide to teachers right now. And that's something that really, I think, needs to be rectified. In fact, of all of the trends that I've talked about today, if there was sort of one takeaway that I would walk out the door with, uh, regardless if you're a K-12 teacher or administrator that is you know, wondering about your own personal and professional development or how you can work with your colleagues and staff to improve upon what you're doing or if you're coming from the higher ed environment. I see some of my higher ed colleagues in, in the audience as well, you know, looking at what can we do in terms of better preparing this next generation of teachers as they walk into the classroom. It really is with that idea of data analytics and the ability to understand data and how to use data in meaningful ways. So before I sort of open it up to questions, I wanted to uh, mention since, you know, CIDR does stand for the Canadian Institute for Distance Education and Research, I did want to point out the fact that there is a chapter in here focused upon Canada. It's one that uh, three folks from the virtual high school in Ontario, in Bayfield, Ontario, um, did. John Smallwood, uh, Jennifer Rayburn, and Stephen Baker uh, produced that chapter, and it's one that I would strongly recommend. In addition to looking at different countries, one of the things that we tried to do was we also tried to look at different programs. So as you look through the, the different ones that we've got there within the case studies, you know, the first one from the U.S. looks at the North Carolina Virtual Public School, uh, which is a statewide supplemental program. Uh, the next one looks at the Nexus Academy, which is a for-profit full-time blended charter school. Uh, the next one looks at Clark County School District Virtual High School, which is a district-based supplemental program. Then you've got the Virtual High School Ontario, which is actually a full-time private uh, online program in Ontario. Um, the program, CECIL program that comes out of Australia is a blended program in that country, a public blended program. Um, and the virtual learning environments one in the UK is one that's actually face-to-face -face programs that are using online tools as a part of their instruction. So while not a blended school, a good example of blended learning within a school and then the final case study, the South Korean one, um, which is actually a really, I think, wonderful example of how a government can really enact change within a system. Um, so that focuses up on the cyber home learning system. And if you're not familiar with the cyber home learning system, sort of the 60 second blurb about it is um, within South Korea, like many of the uh, Asian testing nations that we see, um, Parents tend to spend a lot of their annual income, if they are able to, on tutoring for their students to allow their students to have success in these standardized exams that they have that determine the type of primary, the type of secondary, and the type of university environment that they go to. And um, some parents were actually spending upwards of a third of their household income on tutoring. So over a period of time, the government actually went and provided essentially a online tutoring system free of charge. So the cyber home learning system was designed to essentially be a government-based online tutorial. So all of the course content for the entire K-12 system was created in some wonderful multimedia instruction and um, the government actually paid tutors to hire tutors to be available to students outside of school time. The unintended consequence of this was that so many of the students were actually completing so much of the curriculum online that it, it freed up teachers so that teachers, and because um, you know internet and particularly mobile access in South Korea is so high, it allowed teachers to say, look, I know you're all gonna do the next three lessons online tonight through the cyber home learning system anyway. So go do those three particular ones that I'm gonna tell you. And then tomorrow we can come in and do some more project-based learning, some more creative things in the classroom. So it actually really sort of opened up the ability for uh, teachers to, uh, for lack of a better term, although to use one of the, the blended learning models that we see in the US to really flip their classroom. And it was an unintended consequence of this particular program but it really speaks to the ability of 
a, uh, a government that wants to provide access to a particular aspect um, to improve upon the equity uh, to education that it can really open up creative things within the classroom environment. So I'll stop right there because we've got about 10 minutes left and I've noticed we've had some discussion going on in the chat box as we've been going along but I'll sort of open it up to questions or comments now and I'll let Dan kind of moderate that as we're going through. I don't know if I was trying to watch as we were going through to see if there were any specific questions in the chat box. I didn't see specific ones, um, but if you noticed any, Dan, you can remind me of what they might have been. Great. Thank you. That's Dr. Michael Barbour. It's uh, always been great to see uh, the, the scope and breadth of your your knowledge of the distance education environment across Canada, and it's great to see it applied to a global perspective as well. Um, yes, we did have a flurry of activity around your comments on facilitation and um, and what facilitation means and the, the relationship between that and the sage on the stage. Um, so some, some folks may want to bring that into the questions as well. Um, if you do have a question, click the microphone button in the top bar, click it again when you're done uh, to avoid any feedback. All right, and so we hand over to questions now. Hi, it's Randy Labonte here, and uh, I thought I would jump in just a little bit further expansion of the commentary that was uh, in the middle. So, Michael, when you were talking about the uh, pre-designed courses and teachers as facilitators, uh, Dalina made a comment a little bit about <coughs> um, deprofessionalizing teaching. And my comment was that while that's a start, it's not a finish for teachers in when they're doing a teaching, whether it be blended or online, that managing, uh, remixing, reusing, and, and redistributing sort of the content in a fashion that better meets their learning situation and the students that they have in front of them is an important part of that because otherwise it's just delivery of a textbook or correspondence. And I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit of that. Maybe Daylene, you can jump in on that. Certainly, Randy, I can follow up on that. Um, part of that, I think, comes from this idea of within Canada, like so many countries, we certify teachers. So when I was uh, coming out of my teacher education program in Newfoundland, even though as a part of that program, I focused specifically upon the intermediate and secondary level, and as a part of that program, my two methods courses were both focused upon social studies, I was just certified as a teacher. So if somebody wanted to hire me to teach kindergarten, they could have. If somebody wanted to hire me to teach AP calculus, they could have. I wouldn't have recommended either one, to be perfectly honest with you, because calculus was the one subject that I struggled with personally in high school. And kindergarten, while, you know, I love five-year-olds one at a time, having, you know, a dozen and a half of them or more in the room at any given time is something that I think, you know, sets one on a course to sainthood. Um, but within Canada, like so many countries, we certify someone to be a teacher. In the U.S., and where a lot of this work is coming from, at least from a literature standpoint, they certify a high school math teacher or a elementary teacher or a middle school English teacher. This idea that if you understand good pedagogy and that you, you know, have a good rapport with the students, that because you don't have that subject matter expertise that you can't be a good teacher outside of your particular discipline. And I think that, you know, once you look at an international audience and one of the things that, you know, we've, you know, I know most of the folks in the room here are coming from Canada. Um, yes, while we would like to have our high school math teacher have a math background, maybe have a math degree before they did their education degree, Based upon, you know, the best research that we have available, and if you look at the work of John Hattie as a good example of this, 
teacher subject matter expertise actually has very little impact upon student learning. Having a good teacher in the room has a great impact upon student learning. You know, so, and if you look at those skills that the facilitator possesses, you know, this idea of, you know, teaching students to be more self-directed learners, teaching them to be more intrinsically motivated, teaching them how to have good time management skills, good study skills, how to read a textbook appropriately, those kinds of things. Those are all good teaching skills. Those are all good pedagogy things. Um, so that's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, when we look at this diffusion of the teacher, once you get outside of the U.S. context, it's something that often throws a lot of people because when you start talking about a facilitator, we automatically start thinking parapro. And in all honesty, that's some of what you see happening in the United States, uh, largely because some of this is being done as a way of, you know, saving money and as a way of, you know, crushing teachers' unions because it is a political and ideological thing. Once you leave the U.S., those kinds of things tend to um, wave a little bit and, and we tend to step back from them a bit because we don't see those ideological differences. I see Wendy has her hand raised, so I'll, um, I'll back off here now and allow Wendy to ask her question. Thanks so much, Michael. It's uh, always good to hear you speak. Um, my question, or actually just a request for commentary, is on uh, where you see Canada going or uh, resolving the equity issues that we have with our distance learners, whether they be K-12 or adult, in our rural and remote and northern populations. Um, I'm not seeing a heck of a lot of, um, of fixes to the infrastructure, and that, to me, that's a significant issue for equity. I'm just wondering if anybody out there has seen some research or any have any type of commentary on that. Well, it's, it's interesting and troubling, uh, Wendy, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, it's troubling in the fact that you have what we in the West would describe as these third world countries that are leveraging mobile technologies, that are leveraging distance technologies to provide access to education when you know, us in the developed world, us in the first world, have great difficulty in trying to provide an equitable access to education for those folks that live in rural, remote places, particularly um, our First Nations uh, people that, and, and specifically those that are living in the North. Um, when you look at, you know, the nature of online programs that we have in Canada, um, you're starting to see the development of some programs to reach out into these areas and to these communities. Um, the Kiwetinik Internet High School in Northern Ontario is probably one of the, the, the best success stories I would point to uh, in that respect where you know they have um, an online program that is serving a dozen and a half, almost two dozen communities in Northern Ontario. And, uh, you know, these are fly-in communities, uh, all Aboriginal in nature, uh, where there is no secondary school. So historically, if a student wanted to continue their education after elementary school, they had to leave the community, leave their family, leave the support system that comes with being, uh, you know, home. And, you know, those of us that know anything about, you know, Aboriginal education, in particular know the additional importance that that community support is placed upon the development of uh, youth. And it's unfortunate that these examples of positive instances are so isolated that I can probably sit here and list off the three or four that you could look at that there's been sort of anything written about. Um, and that really, I do think, you know, as you mentioned, leads to infrastructure. Um, you know, there are parts of the country, um, you know, I'm a Newfoundlander by, by birth and, and um, 
you know, I look at, you know, the Smart Labrador Project, which was something that the federal government, where they were able to put bandwidth throughout uh, Labrador, uh, fiber throughout Labrador to increase the bandwidth there. But, you know, that's one small area. If you were to go to northern Quebec, um, you know, which is literally, you know, just in some cases a couple of dozen miles away. Um, they don't have that same access and equity issues. Uh, as you look throughout our territories, uh, that is their biggest challenge. Uh, Randy and I were at a provincial territorial distance ed association meeting a couple of weeks ago, and as our colleagues from the Northwest Territories were talking, uh, one of the biggest issues that they have, they say, is is the the inability of their telecom companies to provide equitable um, bandwidth for the types of programs that they want to run. And that's a real issue for those folks. And, um, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's really disheartening and troubling that, you know, we see such innovative things happening in these parts of the world that so often in North America we look down upon when we aren't able to do the same kinds of things to service our own citizens and, and, and our own students uh, that they're doing. Um, I could continue on this, but I noticed that we're at the top of the hour, so uh, I'm going to leave it at that. And um, I will uh, say that if you do have additional questions about sort of any of these topics or uh, uh, the research in general, or specifically about Tom and uh, my book, or Tom, the book Tom and that and I edited, uh, feel free to contact me. My email is there, um, and I uh, tend to be fairly responsive. And I will turn this back over to Dan now. Great. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, again, Dr. Michael Barbour. And um, thank you also to our audience. Um, be sure to join us in about a month, December 7th, at a special time, 2 p.m., for our next session, uh, which deals with developing countries. All right. And with that, we will end this session and the recording. You can find these slides and the full recording at cider.athabascu.ca.